brush away the cobwebs and get used to candlelight. We're telling creepy stories and there's gonna be a fright. The breeze may make you shiver, so hold on to your liver and beware. You're gonna be scared. Gonna be scared. It's full of bats and rats and ghouls and noises that go bump. It's, it's cold and dark and spooky, spooky. And it's also lots of fun. Look out for bugs and lizards And hold on to your gizzards And beware You're gonna be scared I, I, I'd be worried about this place If I weren't so scared What's that? Oh, it's my knees knocking At a time like this I remember what President Roosevelt said We have nothing to fear But fear itself No I was thinking more along the lines of Master Howard, the paranormal activity in this room indicates the presence of a phantasm. I don't know about that, but I bet there's a ghost in here. What an astoundingly astute observation. A phantom of the funhouse? I wonder where he's hiding. Ghosts. I ain't afraid of no stinking ghosts. I eat ghosts for breakfast. Yeah, sugar-coated ghosts with lots of milk. Ah! Yeah! What? Hey, Stinky, where are you? Oh no, I think Stinky's disappeared. Stinky, this isn't funny. I know you're here, Stinky. I can still smell you. That didn't scare me. Uh, I wanted to be up here. Stinky, is that you? Stinky? What are you doing up there? Me? Oh, I'm just looking for ghosts. You know, they like uh, uh, to hang out in trees. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're tree ghosts. Tree ghosts? How do you know there's not four? <sighs> Come on, Stinky. We're on the Great World Adventure here, not the Jungle Safari. <laughs> so, you're not afraid of ghosts, eh? That's good. Because I have a ghostly little tale to tell you. And we wouldn't want to frighten you now, would we? <laughs> but first, you must look for the key words in the log below, and then find the matching words here on my wall. If you can find all those words below, on these bricks, I will tell you my little tale. <laughs> Just find the letters that form the words, if you dare. This is pretty hard stuff. You have to be a really good word hunter to get this. <laughs> You've done it. It was the middle of the night when Jody crawled from the tent she was sharing with her brother. She didn't really believe what Brad had said about the bears. He was always trying to scare her. Besides, she needed a drink of water. But when she started back in the dark, she heard something strange coming from inside the tent. It didn't sound at all like her brother. It didn't even sound human. With every approaching step, the sound got louder. Slowly, she pulled back the flap of the tent till she could see her sleeping bag moving by itself. Something had crawled inside. A bear! Jody jumped back as Brad appeared out of the dark. That's not our tent, whispered Brad. Don't you recognize Dad snoring? searching through the basement of her grandmother's house when she found the jars. They had black lids with gold labels. On one label were the words, Vanishing Cream. The other said, Remover. She took the lid off of the Vanishing Cream jar, put her finger in the cream, and dabbed a little on the back of her hand. Lindy was about to open the remover jar when she froze in surprise. Her hand was gone! Lindy rubbed some more cream on the other hand and watched it vanish too. 
she found a cracked mirror standing in a corner and rubbed some on her face and watched as her freckled cheeks vanished from view. This was just too cool. Lindy put more of the cream on her until nothing could be seen in the mirror except the now empty jar floating in the air. She ran upstairs and shouted, Surprise! ready to watch everybody scramble. But no one seemed to hear her. When she touched them, they brushed her hand away as if it were a fly. It was like being a ghost, with no one believing she was there. Oh, well, she thought, opening the lid to the remover. It would have been fun. That's when she discovered that the jar of remover was empty. <laughs> You've done it. Mom had never run the vacuum cleaner so long before, thought Rick. What's going on? Rick left his room and went into the living room. Mom and Dad were huddled together near the fireplace. If Mom's not running the vacuum, who is, Rick wanted to know. Run, Rick, run, shouted his dad. Save yourself. Rick looked around the room until he located the vacuum cleaner. Lights were flashing on and off on the front of the unit, and dust was escaping out of the bag. Mom, Dad, stay right there. Rick yelled as he hid behind the couch and made his way toward the monstrous machine. I bet its circuits are blown, Rick thought. This is really weird. The vacuum turned suddenly, racing across the room toward him. He jumped over the couch to avoid it and raced for the plug on the other side of the room where the electrical cord ran. His only chance would be to pull the plug. He reached the outlet just ahead of the vacuum and what he saw there made his heart jump. The plug was already out of the socket. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. The moon was full, casting shadows as if it were daytime. Brian struggled to stay awake, certain that the many-armed monster was waiting for him to fall asleep before attacking. He had first glimpsed the monster two days ago, on the first night of the full moon. The moon started out as a weird orange color that night, but as it rose in the sky, it became a ghostly white. That was when he first saw the moving shadows on the wall across from his bed. He threw a shoe at it and watched it scamper away, hoping it wouldn't return. Brian barely slept the night before, afraid that if he did, he might wake up to find a leg or arm gobbled up by the thing in the dark. Tonight, his panic was at a breaking point. Brian watched in fear as a long, dark tentacle slowly reached up as if to grab him. He scooted down under the covers, hoping against hope that tonight would not be the night he was swallowed whole by those evil-looking jaws. His whole family came running at Brian's high-pitched cry. Watch out, Brian warned. It's going to get us all. Look over there, his dad said, pointing at the window. It's only a little spider trying to catch a fly. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Mark was sitting on the edge of the pier with his bare toes dipping into the water. He held on to his homemade fishing pole lightly. He hadn't gotten very many bites that day. He'd given up on minnows and was trying out a new type of bait, which didn't seem to be working. His gaze wandered out to the middle of the lake. It looked like a windstorm might be coming in. The still surface of the lake was turning into white-capped waves. Mark felt a tug on his line. Maybe we'll have fish for dinner after all, he thought. He slowly pulled back on the pole so as not to frighten his catch away. The tugging stopped. Mark pulled his pole out of the water to check his bait. It was still there, although it seemed to have something green on it. Back into the water it went. A few minutes passed. Mark decided that if he didn't catch anything the next time he felt a bite, it would be time to pack it up and go home. 
His stomach had started growling, so it must be close to dinner time. He was glad to feel a slight tugging on the pillow. This time, he waited a few seconds before starting to pull back. The tugging became more frequent and hard, pulling the little bobber under the waves. Mark just knew this had to be a big one. He couldn't wait to land that fish and rush home to show his dad. He gave a great yank on the pole, and for a moment, he couldn't believe his eyes. He hadn't caught the five-pound bass he'd been imagining. He dropped the pole, and the scaly green hand sank back into the depths of the lake. Mark let out a shriek and ran for home, knowing Dad wouldn't believe this fish story. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Once in a town not far from here appeared a man with just one leg. In place of where his other leg would have been was a large wooden spike. The doctors told him there was nothing they could do. He decided then that if he couldn't have two real legs, then nobody else should either. That night, he crept around while all the people in town were sleeping and gave each person a wooden leg. The police looked all over for him, but nobody ever saw him again. Don't worry. That was many years ago, and by now he's probably far, far away. Or is he? <laughs> Done. Kenny rubbed his rabbit's foot charm furiously as the Ferris wheel squeaked to a halt, leaving his car dangling at the top. It wasn't the height that frightened him. It was the monstrous eyes staring back from the car ahead. Long, hairy arms began to reach toward him. His screams were loud, but they just mixed into the sounds of the other rides nearby. Kenny rubbed his rabbit's foot even harder. He could almost feel the monster's gruesome hands on his face when, thankfully, the Ferris wheel began to move again. They never found any monster on the ride. But then, all they ever found on Kenny's Ferris wheel car was a rabbit's foot. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Harriet liked bugs. Everyone called her the bug girl. She would examine them with her magnifying glass. And if it was different, she would use her tweezers to drop it in a jar with a wad of cotton dipped in a strong-smelling liquid and watch until the bugs slowly stopped moving. Then she would add it to her collection of bugs pinned to padded trays with long needles. One day... She went to a swamp to find some really different bugs. She trudged through the muck, peered under bushes and turned over rocks. But all she kept finding were bugs she'd seen before. Suddenly, something grabbed her from behind and lifted her, kicking and struggling into the air. When she turned around, she couldn't believe what she saw. Holding her clamped in one of its giant pincers was the largest bug she had ever seen. It stood as tall as a house, and as it held her to its beetle-like eye, she could see herself reflected a hundred times over. And then the bug opened its mouth and said, Different. And that's when Harriet let out a shriek when she saw it lifting up a jar. <laughs> fearfully over his shoulder. Nothing was there. Everyone was being extra careful lately, what with the escaped lunatic from the state asylum running loose. He hurried on his way, 
noticing that the lampposts along the street were coming on. Now that summer was over, the night came on quicker. Lee turned a corner and began to walk faster. Suddenly, he heard footsteps behind him. He looked back, but couldn't see anything in the darkening street. Lee sped up until he was almost running. The footsteps increased in speed also. Lee looked around and saw a dark figure running towards him, waving its arms. Lee grabbed a rock from the ground and hurled it like a missile at the thing following him. A voice shouted to him, Lee, wait up, it's just me. Lee paused in a doorway as he recognized the voice of a boy from school. Paul ran up to Lee, breathing heavily. I've been trying to catch you, he said. You're supposed to come to my house and wait for your mom. Lee said, you really scared me. I heard someone following me and thought you were that lunatic. Paul said, don't be such a scatterbrain. Do you think the lunatic would know your name? The two boys headed down the street toward Paul's house, walking quickly by the shadowed doorways of the dark street. Suddenly, a searchlight swept over the boys and spotlighted a figure in the doorway they had just passed. Hold it right there. We've got you covered, a voice shouted. The boys whirled round, looking in dismay at the crazed man in the light. That was a close one, boys, a policeman said. I bet he's been following you for some time. But don't worry, we've got him now. Before getting into the police car, the lunatic threw up his arms and let out a blood-curdling sound. <laughs> There's an old drawbridge that crosses Dead Elm Stream, and they say it's haunted by a headless horseman who rides his large black stallion across the bridge when the moon is full. They say he's tall and skinny, like a scarecrow, and his loud, sad wails sound like the howling of a wild jackal. He carries a leather bag slung over his shoulder. Who is the headless horseman? What does he carry in his leather bag? I'll tell you his story. He was a shy shopkeeper who was liked by everyone in town. One night he went to a dance and had the bad luck to fall in love with Sarah, the beautiful young teacher. But another man named Jerome wanted Sarah all to himself. Later that night, as the shopkeeper rode his beautiful stallion home, Jerome attacked him and cut off his head. When Sarah heard what had happened, she jumped in the stream and drowned. Jerome left town and was never heard from again. But when the night is clear and the moon is full, the ghost of the horseman rides his stallion across the drawbridge, crying, Sarah, in long, sad wails. And he carries his own head in his leather bag. <laughs> You've done it. There's a surprise at the bottom, the cereal box said, with its smiling Admiral Crackle and his first mate Fred. And Tina meant to have it, was certain it was hers. Then Timmy called for Daddy, and things turned for the worse. Let your brother have it. You got the one before. Then Daddy picked up Timmy and took him through the door. She held on to the box, wondering how she could get her way, when Admiral Crackle whispered, You can have it, Tina, if you do just what we say. Just wait till later, the cartoon said, and when they're fast asleep, sneak into the kitchen and you can get the treat. Admiral Crackle chuckled, and first mate Fred gave her a wink. Tina came down as the moon came up, casting its pale, sugary light. She pulled the box from the cupboard and held it to her tight. The surprise is in the corner, Admiral Crackle said. Tina reached into the box as a chuckle came from Fred. Just a little farther, you're really almost there. Then something grabbed her arm, and with a pop, crackle, and snap, Tina was gone. <laughs> well done. 
That night it was Ben's turn to play Ding Dong Ditch at old Mrs. Withers' house. No one had ever seen her, but everyone said she was a witch. His friends waited as Ben headed up the front path. Her porch was rickety, with cobwebs all around. He could feel his heart pounding and his stomach doing somersaults. He tripped over a dusty old broom and picked it up when suddenly someone was at the door. His friends took off, but Ben was paralyzed with fear. A wrinkled but sweet smile greeted him. Still nervous, he handed Mrs. Withers the broom and she actually thanked him. She was no witch. He felt better now as he walked back down the path until a chill wind brushed past him. And Mrs. Withers took to the sky on her broomstick. <laughs> well done. The cold Halloween night was turning colder. The wind whistled through the bare limbs of the trees. The masquerade party inside the abandoned church was winding down quickly, and the partygoers were becoming desperate to reach home before the winter rain turned into sleet. John shivered as the lights from the last car flashed over the tombstones in the graveyard next to the church. Maybe having a Halloween party in this church was not such a great idea after all. John slowly turned away from the window and surveyed the remains of the party. Streamers hung from the ceiling, paper plates and cups littered the tables, and a few chairs were overturned in everyone's haste to get home. John regretted his quick offer to clean up by himself. Now that there were no more revelers, the little church felt kind of eerie. As John made his way around the room picking up trash, he heard a rustling sound that was unlike the noise he was making with the trash bag. He stopped to listen, and the rustling noise stopped. It's probably just my imagination, thought John. I'm just a little nervous, but who wouldn't be? John continued to clean, and the rustling began again. This time the noise was accompanied by a thin wail. John dropped the trash bag and grabbed a broom for protection. There are no ghosts here. It's just the wind and the rain, and my imagination is getting to me, John muttered to himself. A loud crash made John jump and whip his head around. What was that? John held the broom in front of him like a sword as he slowly made his way toward the door on the other side of the room. John dropped his broom as a blood-curdling wail stopped him in his tracks. I can't let a few scary sounds terrify me, John reassured himself. He gathered his courage and entered the room. The door slammed behind him with a loud crash. Let me out, John screamed, as he fumbled with the locked doorknob. John froze as he felt it tapping on his shoulder. He slowly turned around and came face to face with a rattling skeleton. This is our party now, chattered the skull, underneath a crumpled leftover party hat. John realized the room was filled with ghostly figures. You're not welcome here, a chorus of dead, scratchy voices shrilled. John threw himself through the door with the strength of ten men. The hollow laughter of the skeleton and his friends followed him out of the church. <laughs> Done. Jenna giggled as she looked in the mirror and tried to read the poster on her wall. Since it appeared backwards, it was tough to read. She wondered what it might be like if everything were backwards, but that seemed ridiculous and she giggled some more. Just then, everything in the mirror flashed as bright as the sun. She blinked a few times, then looked around to make sure everything was okay. The stuff in her room was still there all right, but it all seemed weird for some reason. She wasn't sure why until she looked up again at her poster. It was backwards. She had to look in the mirror just to read it. Somehow she'd been transported to the other side of the mirror and everything was backwards now. 
Jenna started to panic, then heard her mom calling her. She opened her eyes and saw her mom leaning over her, telling her it was time to wake up. It must have been a dream. As Jenna breathed a sigh of relief, she noticed her mom's sweatshirt. It said, Mom, M-O-M. -M. Was it really a dream? <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Bernie and his family moved into a big old house. One day, when he was exploring in the garden, he came across a woman. Who are you? Bernie asked. I'm the cook in this house, said the woman. I've lost my ring. Will you help me find it? Bernie looked around on the ground. He got on his hands and knees and looked under some bushes. Then he saw something glimmer. Here it is, he said. Oh, thank you, said the woman. I'll bake you some cookies later. That evening, Bernie found a plate of cookies on the desk in his room. When his father came by to say good night, he asked where the cookies had come from. The cook made them for me because I found her ring in the garden, said Bernie. They're really good. Here. Have one. We don't have a cook, said his father. There was a cook in this house once, but she died a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly turned black as Ricky's older brother slammed the storm cellar door, plunging him into darkness. Ricky pounded uselessly on the door, screaming, Let me out! I can't see anything down here! I'm gonna tell Mom on you, so let me out! Ricky could hear his brother's laughter fade as he ran away. Ricky slowly turned and sat down on a step. He couldn't see anything down here. It was as dark and rank-smelling as he imagined an old dungeon would be. As his heart slowed down, he became aware of other sounds in the darkness. He heard a slight fluttering noise from a far corner, and a slurping sound soon followed. Ricky tried to open the door, but his brother must have put something over it as a barricade. He was trapped and couldn't get out until his brother decided to come back. As his eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness, Ricky could see something moving in the far corner. That must be where the noise is coming from, he thought. He could make out a strange shape, but couldn't imagine what it might be. Ricky quickly ran his hands over the walls next to him, looking for a weapon in case he had to defend himself from an attack. His hand touched a flashlight, which Ricky quickly turned on. The light was dim, but he could see the walls and stairs around him. His eyes adjusted to the new light, and he looked farther into the cellar where he thought the noises were coming from. Standing with its back to him was a buzzard, who was eating his small meal with great dignity. The bird raised his head, and the lifeless look in its eyes and its vacant stare sent a chill through Ricky. He dropped the flashlight, and once again the cellar was plunged into darkness. The door behind him suddenly creaked open, and it was Ricky's brother. His brother slowly walked in as Ricky raced past him. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. He could have picked any tree, but Jason climbed the one that seemed to be smiling. His father was looking all over for him, but Jason thought, I can hide here forever. That's when all the branches began to tremble, and the tree started to grow up, up and away. It was alive and carrying Jason with it. He tried to climb down branch after branch, swinging from one, jumping to reach the next. Was he getting any closer to the ground? He wasn't sure. Suddenly he felt something grab him around the waist. It's got me, thought Jason. 
His hands held tight to the branch above him, but whatever was tugging was too strong, and he was pulled away. He looked around and saw that he was in his father's arms. Whew, said Jason. It must have been my imagination. He looked back at the tree, and the tree smiled. <laughs> Congratulations, puzzle solved. William's mother told him that if he kept playing his computer games, he would end up being a computer game himself. Then she sighed. You can play your game, she said, but only after you do your chores and your homework. William fed his goldfish, and then he went to his room to do his homework. Arithmetic was his favorite subject, and he finished fast. He also studied for his spelling test. Then he played his computer game. In this game, a fox went into the chicken house to eat chickens, and the farmer had to chase the fox away. As he was playing, he started to feel funny. Then he found himself holding a pitchfork. He looked around. There he was in the chicken house. And there was the fox trying to eat the chickens. William yelled at the fox and swung the pitchfork. He chased the fox away. The fox had eaten only two chickens. That was his best score ever. Then William heard his father calling to him. It was dinner time. William rubbed his eyes. What a strange experience. He must have dreamt it. But at dinner, when his arm itched, he pulled up his sleeve. There he found a piece of straw. <laughs> Congratulations, puzzle solved. Hey, Bobby, what are you doing with my mom's magic camera? Uncle Bernie yelled as he snatched it from Bobby's hands. Bobby knew he was about to hear one of his uncle's dumb stories. Yep, yep, mom's magic instant camera. The only magic model ever made, exclaimed Bernie. If you took my picture, the lens would pull me into a magic room and would squish me down on the film. Whatever you do, don't take my picture, Bernie warned. Bobby, not believing his uncle, who was always making up stories, took the camera and snapped his picture. In a blinding blue flash, his annoying Uncle Bernie was gone forever. Bobby gave the police the picture of a horrified Bernie, hopelessly trying to escape from an invisible room. Bobby asked his tearful mother if he could have Grandma's camera to remember Bernie by. You just never know when it might come in handy, he said with a wicked smile. <laughs> You've done it. Pat lay in bed with his hands on his abdomen. His stomach hurt, and he was in agony. The only good thing about this was that he got to stay home from school. His mother brought him some tea for breakfast and then left him alone to sleep. She went out to the yard to dig dandelions. Pat was just falling asleep when he noticed something move out of the corner of his eye. He looked and saw that the plant in the window was suddenly growing very fast. He quickly reached the floor and then started to creep up to his bed. The plant was coming for him. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. The plant wrapped itself around his ankle. Pat was terrified, but he whacked the leaves with his fist. Then he heard something in the hall. It was his father coming to check on him. As quickly as it had reached him, the plant went back to its pot in the windowsill. His father looked in. Everything okay, he asked. Pat was out of breath. Yes, he said, but I think I'm allergic to that fern. Will you move it? Of course, his father said, and carried it out of the room. <laughs> You've done it. One night, as Billy was about to go to sleep, he thought he felt something breezy against his neck. Something like 
like the warm, stinky breath of a hairy, dirty monster. Billy started to turn over, but thought, it's probably just my imagination, and nestled back to sleep. But then Billy felt something move his bed. Something like, like a hairy, dirty monster with warm, stinky breath and a dozen glowing eyes crawling from beneath his bed to grab him while he slept. Billy started to open his eyes, but thought, it's probably just a dream. But then Billy felt something put its hands on his shoulder. Something like, like a hairy, dirty monster with long, sharp claws and warm, stinky breath and a dozen glowing eyes reaching for his throat. What's going on here? Billy's mother asked at the sound of Billy's shout. I don't know, Billy's sister said. I just went to kiss Billy goodnight and he started to yell. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. They say that if you listen hard enough, you can hear the footsteps of the ghost of Molly Mulligan running through the hills. And some say that on a clear night, when there's a full moon, you can even see her running through the valley, waving a large knife. Even after all these years, she still guards her cave full of gold, and no one dares disturb it. Molly was a pioneer who settled in the nearby town. One day, when she was out walking in the hills, she discovered an old gold mine. She put a claim to all of the gold and moved into the cave to protect it. She chased everyone away and even killed one man who tried to steal the gold. Then, one winter night, there was a terrible blizzard. It got colder than it had ever been before. Friends tried to get Molly to come home where it was warm, but she wanted to stay with her gold, and she chased them all away with a large knife. The next morning, they found her sitting at the mouth of the cave, holding her knife in her blue hands. She had frozen, but no one has ever gone into the cave to get the gold, because her ghost guards it still. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. It is a cold winter night. The driving rain stings like a hornet, and the cold wind goes through your bones like a needle. In the dim lamplight, you see a carriage. Is it the carriage of the town's only millionaire, old Mr. Potter? You see? Inside the carriage, you can see old Mr. Potter. He's shivering in the cold. He sits there every night waiting. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for his young wife, the woman he married 50 years ago. He took a vow that he would always protect her. But then one night, he was having fun with friends, and he forgot to pick her up. It was a cold, stormy night, like this. She got tired of waiting and started to walk home. She lost her way and died in the freezing rain. Old Mr. Potter was heartbroken, and he never forgave himself for not picking her up that night. That's why you see him sitting, crying in his carriage night after night. Done. Danny finished weeding the garden. His hands were sore from pulling weeds out by the roots. I should just take a bulldozer to all these weeds and be through with them once and for all, he thought. As he was washing his hands under the faucet, he heard a voice behind him. Young man, you did a beautiful job weeding that garden. I have a notion to get you to help me with my weeds. Danny looked around. An old woman stood there, wringing a yellow lace handkerchief in her hands. She was very thin, and her hair was white. Here is my address, she said, and handed him a piece of paper. Come by on Saturday, and I'll pay you fifty cents to weed my plot. Danny took the paper, then he reached to turn off the water. When he looked up, the woman was gone, 
and all he heard was a breeze rustling in the trees. On Saturday, Danny set out to find the address on the piece of paper. 13 Dead End Avenue, he read. I think that's on the edge of town. When he got there, Danny found nothing but a cemetery. He stopped. Very strange, he thought. But then he saw plot number 13. It had weeds growing high. Danny was scared, but the old woman had seemed nice, so he decided he would pull the weeds. When he got down to the last corner, he found an old lace handkerchief tied up in a knot. When he untied it, he found two shiny quarters inside. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. Lisa was walking home from a Halloween party at school when she took a shortcut down an alley. Up ahead she saw the light of a glowing fire. And dancing around the fire were three witches. Lisa started to turn around and run, but the witches saw her and grabbed her. Please don't hurt me, said Lisa. I won't tell anyone I saw you. The witches looked at each other. Do you think she's telling the truth, one of them asked? She'll probably tell someone unless we do something to her so she won't tell. Lisa started to cry. Please don't hurt me, she said. We won't hurt you. We aren't bad witches. We are good witches. But we have to be sure that you won't tell anyone you saw us. So we'll have to do something to you. What will it be? They thought carefully. Lisa shook with fear. I know, said one witch. Let's give her the ability to fly. She'll like it so much, she won't tell anyone, because if she tells, we'll take it away. Then they said a spell, and waved their arms, and suddenly Lisa could fly. It was the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to her. She would fly at night when the stars were shining. She could look down on the entire town. And she liked flying so much that she never told anyone about the witches she saw that night. Each evening when the sun goes down, See if you can see Lisa or one of the witches flying in the sky and cackling, especially on Halloween. <laughs> Congratulations, puzzle solved. Did you hear that? I heard a noise from somewhere outside the closet. Since I was very little, I've heard the stories about the thing that lives out there. I've heard about how every night it comes to sleep just outside our home. It creaks all night as it turns over in bed. What you think is the wind is really the sound of this life form breathing. Everything shakes and rattles. You think it's a sudden earthquake. But it's this creature running around out there. What really scares me and makes my fur stand on end is when it suddenly opens my door. It reaches in and grabs things and then pulls them out. Other times, it pushes its stuff inside the closet, forcing you into a corner. You're left there all scrunched up with no way out. All you can do is sit there, hiding your head behind your claws. There it is again. That sound from outside. Quick, run over here and hide behind this shoe. There's nothing we monsters fear more than the person who lives outside the closet. <laughs> Anne's mother called her in from the backyard and asked her to go to the store to buy some fresh vegetables for dinner. Anne rode her bicycle down to the grocery store and bought some carrots and celery. She also bought a newspaper because she knew her mother liked to read it. A dark cloud was in the sky and a fog was rolling in. Before long, Anne couldn't see where she was going. She got off her bicycle and started walking. Now she was getting scared. Then she saw a light shining up ahead. 
a little boy in a yellow raincoat was holding a flashlight. Hi, he said. You must be lost. You're very near the river. You need to go the other direction. Here, take my flashlight. I guess I am lost, said Anne. Thank you for the flashlight, but what will you do? Oh, I'll be fine, said the little boy. I know where I am. Anne slowly found her way home. After dinner, her mother was reading the newspaper. Oh my, she said. A little boy drowned in the river yesterday. He was wearing a yellow raincoat and he was holding a flashlight when they found him. Anne ran up to her room. The flashlight the little boy had given her was gone. <laughs> well done. Juanita did not want to eat any more asparagus, but she had to clean her plate or she would not get to go to Katie's party tonight. She was desperate to go to Katie's party. It was the event of the year. She knew she would simply die of embarrassment if she didn't get to go. So she closed her eyes and held her nose and swallowed the last of the asparagus. Can I go now, Dad? she asked. I'm late already. Yes, said her father. But don't forget to go the long way. Don't take the shortcut through the woods. It's dangerous in there. I'm not afraid, said Juanita. What can hurt me? Demons, said her father, and don't deny that you are afraid. I know you are, even if you do not appear to be. But Juanita was in too much of a hurry to get to the party, and she decided to take the shortcut through the woods anyway. She walked fast. It was getting very dark. Suddenly Juanita stopped. She thought she heard something moving in the trees. She held her breath and listened. She was sorry she had disobeyed her father. She began to sing to herself loudly and started walking very fast. Finally, she saw the lights of Katie's house and breathed a sigh of relief. When she got to the party, everyone was excited. Pedro had a scare, they said. He heard a ghost singing in the woods. Juanita started to say it was her, but then she decided not to make anyone aware of her story. <laughs> You've done it. It's an easy dare, Roberto teased his buddies as he climbed the steps of the old mansion. His friends ran as the huge wood door creaked open just as he was about to knock. Yes, the strange butler said. I would like to see your friendly ghost, if you please, he requested with fearless formality. Indeed. Follow me, then, the butler's voice croaked. Roberto found himself standing in front of an old refrigerator. Well, Roberto demanded. The butler opened the door. There, sitting on the top shelf, was a smiling, waving, friendly ghost stuffed inside of a large pickle jar. Feeling like a giant goosebump, Roberto turned to look at the butler. Before him was an enormous, green-eyed, slobbering phantasm who declared, I'm the nasty ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Andy liked to read, and he went to the library every chance he got. Sometimes he went after school, and then he was often the only one there. He became friends with Mr. Jackson, who worked in the library. There were some old paintings of different people on the walls, and Mr. Jackson sometimes told Andy stories about them. They were all dead now, but Mr. Jackson talked about them like they were his friends. 
One evening, when Andy was in the library, Mr. Jackson was talking to him. Suddenly he turned white and put his hand on his heart. He was in pain. Andy was scared. He was trying to think of what to do when a young woman came through the door. I'm a doctor, she said. I can help. Please go call 911. Andy found the telephone and called. When he got back, the woman was gone and Mr. Jackson was sitting up. He pointed to one of the paintings. Andy looked at it and gasped. The painting was of the young woman who was just there. She was the first woman doctor in our county, said Mr. Jackson. Over one hundred years ago. <laughs>